want you to hit me as hard as you can. Go, go. So Ryan Reynolds has returned to the red spandex suit to drop some more wisecracks and crack some more skulls in Deadpool 2. And with this sequel receiving another week's worth of great reviews and box office, Ryan Reynolds has once again proven to Hollywood that it is okay to make a film adaptation of an adult comic book that respects its source material, as well as the audience. Now, if you want to see what it looks like when Hollywood goes down the wrong direction, look no further than what New Line Cinema did to another underground comic book superhero for adults known as The Mask which may have taken away the bloody violence and foul language of the Dark Horse comic book for its PG-13 film adaptation, but still came out with a beloved hit comedy that helped launch the careers of both Cameron Diaz and Jim Carrey. But after getting burned by Ace Ventura 2, Jim Carrey would turn down a $10 million payday for a mask sequel, after swearing never to do another sequel to one of his movies again. I lied. So you can bet fans like me who had grown up on the original movie were truly surprised to see this teaser trailer pop up in front of the return of the king. Known through legend, feared by all. Some people spend their entire lives in search of such powers. And others are just born with it. What the fuck is that? Yeah, the big trailer that New Line Cinema had paired up with the last Lord of the Rings movie was for a Jim Carrey free sequel to The Mask that hadn't even begun filming, didn't even have a title yet, and wouldn't hit theaters for over a year. And when Son of the Mask finally did arrive in theaters, scientists found out that this dancing CGI baby would also be joined on screen by Jamie Kennedy and Alan Cumming. So you can guess for yourself that audiences stayed away from this sequel in droves, while critics declared it to be one of the worst movies of recent years. But as someone who had adored the first film in my childhood and was always curious to see what could be done with a sequel, I'm open to rewatching this flick with a more open mind. After all, I was such a big fan of that first movie that I even went and read some of the original comic books of The Mask at the age of seven years old. <laughs> I learned a lot of interesting things that day. So we open back in the metropolis of Edge City as a tour is being led through a museum's Norse mythology exhibit by none other than Ben Stein, reprising his psychologist character from the first film as well as the animated series, making him the only actor to make it through the entire Mask franchise. Wow. On display at this museum is the magical mask created by Loki, the god of mischief. And what a coincidence that Loki himself happens to be in this tour group, who's been looking around the city for his lost magical mask only to find the one at the museum is a fake replica. This is a fake! Yes, but it's a good fake. Ow. Let me replace it. What? What are, what are you doing? If you thought Clear Eyes was awesome, then wait until you try brand new Clear Face for dry, itchy faces. Where's my face? Let me back my face! Wow. Then we open in Edge City's neighboring territory, named Fringe City. No. No. Mm -mm. Where the actual mask has floated downriver to now come into the possession of aspiring cartoonist Tim Avery, played by Jamie Kennedy, who lives in a nice suburb with his businesswoman wife Tanya, played by Trailer Howard from Dirty Work and Monk, and just like Stanley Ipkiss had his loyal dog Milo, Tim also has a loyal dog friend named Otis. Mm -mm. No. No. And Tim is trying to break out his animation career by working as a tour guide at the studios of a famous animator played by Stephen Wright, alongside his pal Jorge, played by Carl Penn. When you want things to change, you gotta make them change. You ever pitch to the top man himself? Daniel Moss? And it's time to man up my road dog because there he is. And now I just want to see a crossover movie where the guy on the couch rolls up a blunt with Kumar. Wow. So with the studio's Halloween party coming up, Tim is forced to use the mask his dog found for him as a last minute costume idea. I can't go as this. Everyone in Imagine always goes all out with their costumes. This is the crappiest piece of crap in crap town. But enough about the reviews for this film, because the mask is now sucking onto Tim's face and transforming him into... Don't 
Don't you just love Halloween? I'm all crack. And why don't we just increase the nightmares further by having the newly green-faced Jamie Kennedy try to show us his variation on Jim Carrey's acclaimed Cuban Pete musical number from the first film, as he takes the beloved Frankie Valli standard Can't Take My Eyes Off of You and rings it through a nightmarish variety of musical parodies. No! Out in the way that I stare, no one else who can compare. No! I love you, baby. No! You're just too good to be true. Hell no! Shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it! I refuse. No! This is the part where you boogie. This is the part where you go. And since Tim promised his wife earlier that the two of them would finally try conceiving a child once he gets back home from the party, he gets it on with her while still wearing the mask, and she finds herself pregnant the very next day, complete with a pregnancy that has Tanya throwing up bubbles and craving silly string. Warning, do not eat silly string while you're pregnant or else you will give birth to the eraser head baby. And when his newborn son, Alvi, is introduced into the world, Tim doesn't yet know his infant son has the magical powers of Loki's mask born into his DNA. But he's about to find out when Tanya has to leave for a business trip and Tim is left alone for the next few days to care for Alvi. And Tim dumps his son in front of the TV to watch some classic cartoons that I should be watching instead of this fucking vomit. But with his magical powers, Alvi can now recreate all these cartoon gags he's seeing on TV in real life, so he can get back at his neglectful father. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my ragman. Baby, my honey, you me. How do you me? Don't you me alone, my And tell me I'm your own. Check, please. I mean, let's just face facts, the only mass sequel that could have possibly worked would have had to star Jim Carrey. His rubber face and lightning fast wit is what made that first movie work in the first place. And if Jim Carrey won't do it, then just reboot it in the gritty vein of the original comic books. So knowing all the potential that New Line Cinema has left untapped, I really do think this is one of the worst movies that I have personally seen. Partly because of my childhood hopes for a good mass sequel, and partly because this film is a hyper-edited sensory assault of shitty jokes and shittier effects. And Jamie Kennedy had no chance of becoming a leading man with what he's given here. I know the dude has made a whole documentary about how the reception of this movie hurt his feelings and made him hate movie critics. So let me, as a movie critic, make clear that I think Jamie Kennedy is probably a fine person, and I've genuinely enjoyed some of his work. It's not his fault that he's playing such a whiny man-child of a character who's clearly unfit to be either a father Go on, Alvy. Sing to me! Well, come on. Start dancing again. Start screwing my mind! Or a lead hero for a blockbuster superhero sequel. Float like a butterfly. Sting like a bee. Well, shoot like a grasshopper. Stink like a skunk. Well, at least New Line Cinema included a sneak peek of their Creed sequel, and I gotta say, it looks pretty awesome. Rattlers and unbelievable. The more likable lead of the film here is Alan Cumming, who certainly out fabuluses Tom Hiddleston in the role of Loki, but sadly has to deal with the late great Bob Hoskins, slumming it as his nagging father Odin. And poor Eddie Valiant looks less like Anthony Hopkins here, and more like Beowulf meets Wolford Brimley. Beowulf or Brimley, if you will. Please, Father, give me my powers. Your mother says we should be trying positive reinforcement. Whatever the hell that is, that is. But Cumming and Hoskins end up like all the other actors in succumbing to this irritating CGI chaos. Hell, even the dog gets in on the action when he finally dons the mask much like Milo did in the first movie. <laughs> where he and the mischief-making baby engage in a literal war for Jamie Kennedy's love and affection, which is a classic cartoon formula. But when you use flesh and blood actors to act out cartoon antics and you cannot make it look as good as the first movie, then you end up with a 95 minute long horror film about a murderous dog who wants to explode an infant into little pieces. You kids in the audience think this movie is fun yet? Huh? 
And despite every effort on the part of the same director who gave us the acclaimed masterpiece Cats and Dogs, it is a film as filthy and rotten as its cynical intentions. Sure, the first mask isn't some untouchable masterpiece, but much like the fans who were looking forward to this follow-up, it deserved a far less pitiful excuse for a sequel than this. And to think, this movie failed to exploit the dynamic comedic persona and wild Robin Williams-style improv that we associate with the legendary Jamie Kennedy. I think Jamie Kennedy is probably a fine person. Now it's time to shift our focus from smoking and switch up our blunts for cans of beer so we can start drinking to play the awfully good drinking game. Take a shot or drink every time we see Alan Cumming donning another disguise to look for the son of the mask. Yes? Good afternoon. Hey, I'm Rod. Guess who? No! Yeah, you? No, you idiot. <sighs> and you know what? I think the Terminator could have also had an easier time finding Sarah Connor had he just disguised himself as a Girl Scout. Sarah Connor? Yes. Put the cooking down! Now! Bob Hoskins as Odin pops back up to yell at Loki again. Shh! Loki! You wake the baby. Well, at least you could say that this movie did help reteam Bob Hoskins back with baby Herman one last time before he passed away. I tell you, man, the whole thing stinks like yesterday's diapers. And also, Bob Hoskins can possess the bodies of other characters in the movie. I've had to hear with you. Dad, please listen to me. Thor never gave me this kind of trouble. Oh, here we go again with the Thor crap. So now this movie feels like if he had lived long enough to reprise the role of Mario for a Super Mario Odyssey film adaptation. <laughs> This is time! You see either Jamie Kennedy or the dog put on the mask. Honey, I think it's time we trade up. Wow, what a trade up indeed. You now drive a full-size Hot Wheels car with Steve Harvey's teeth glued on the front grill. Still a great night. And take a double shot for the two times you see Tim's nosy next door neighbor have her head turned into a big nose. <laughs> Nosy neighbors. Okay, first off, Mrs. Hoggett from Babe deserves to be in better movies than this shit. And secondly, what breed of Cronenbergian body horror has this woman turned into? <laughs> Somebody call Gina Davis and put this woman out of her misery already. And on the nudie watch, I'm going to instead take this time to talk about a certain scene from this film, which you're not going to see if you rent this movie online. But I clearly remember watching this scene when this shitty movie aired on TBS. It's a scene right after Tim lays in bed with his wife to conceive their son, where the camera swoops inside her uterus to reveal the spirit of the mask. Well then, now I know what it would look like if an opening credit sequence from a Look Who's Talking movie replaced the sperm with the fucking Mucinex mascots. <laughs> On the enjoyableness continuum scale from Boulder Bruce, Son of the Mask is at the very least a great advertisement for birth control of the mask, and spins in a green tornado to turn into a 2 out of 10. I would have had more fun watching Son of Mask, starring Eric Stoltz alongside a CGI dancing baby as motion captured by Cher. Do you believe? I'm Jesse Schaefer, Jobo.com, and since a lot of you are probably wondering what happened to the kid who won that Nintendo Power Contest for a walk-on role in the Mass sequel, he was actually set a consolation prize after Jim Carrey had turned that sequel down. And that prize consisted of a couple of Super Nintendo games, a crew jacket for the Mass 2, and $5,000. Meanwhile, I asked Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema for a consolation prize after watching all 95 minutes of this garbage movie, and all they sent me was an autograph from that guy in the first movie who had played Doyle. Doyle? You son of a bitch! You said much too much to ask.